Okay, uh, part two of this video. So we went through the current assets and we noticed that there are significantly fewer fixed assets out there for Oracle. Uh, and this makes sense because it is a software company. So their, their value add is in software. It's really a bunch of ones and zeros sitting in a program somewhere that really create the value out there. They don't make their, their value add based upon uh, factories or machinery or, or anything like that. It's all really intellectual property and, um, and based upon uh, the, the product, the programming that's out there. So we would expect to see a lot of uh, intangible assets out there, which we do here. We see a lot of intangible assets and goodwill out there. Not a lot of uh, plant and equipment out there to manufacture something because everything is really on a disk out there instead of being an inventory in a warehouse somewhere. So this makes sense that we would have a lot more current assets than we would fixed assets. Uh, it also makes sense that we would see a lot of goodwill out there. This is an IT business and uh, acquisitions happen all the time. Somebody comes up with a better better way to do something in their database, they go out and they, they buy it. They, they do their R&D that way where they, they go out and they outsource R&D to these other companies. Uh, and we'll, we'll come back to that a little bit later. That's going to be important later. Also, these intangible assets that we see out there, there's a lot of intangibles out there, a lot of patents. Uh, and that becomes important. Also, when we get into the discussion of these patent wars that we're hearing a lot about between Google and Oracle and Apple and Microsoft and all these big IT companies are, are going into a patent war where they're buying up patents or they're using patents as protection uh, as sort of a mutually assured destruction type strategy when it comes to intellectual property. So uh, intangible assets become important in this type of industry as well for that reason. It becomes a, a defensive measure. Um, okay, so let's go to the liabilities. Uh, we can see here current liabilities, 15 billion uh, and 12 billion on trailing 12 months. Uh, compare that to 40 and 41. We have a very nice ratio up there. Not a lot of, not a lot of current liabilities out there for us to to worry about compared to our current assets. And you can even see that the biggest chunk of that is deferred revenue, which means that we've been paid for services that we're going to render. And this would make sense if there was a annual license out there. So in December or January, a uh, company pays for their full year's license. Um, Oracle doesn't recognize that revenue all at once. They have to recognize it over the, over the month. So their biggest liability is is money that they've already been paid for services that they're going to render uh, throughout the year. So deferred revenue, this isn't really a liability uh, in a traditional sense, but it's it's something they, they're going to owe, but it's not something that's going to cost them a whole lot to produce. It's not like they have to pay uh, this much in services. They really just have to let their, their software run and maintain their software over over the next uh, period of time that they owe the services. So this liability, I, I would discount the value of this at, at not being this much because what they're really going to what's really going to cost them to pay off that debt is not going to be the seven billion or the six point five billion dollars. Um, so they, that drops current liabilities even further, which means that they're even more stable, which is which is a good thing. And then we look at long-term debt. Uh, this number seems high, but again, you got to take into account that they are a $167 billion company. So in proportion, it doesn't seem that high. So as a ratio to total assets, it's it's a rather small number. They're not highly leveraged. They do have some debt out there, which is which is okay, but it's it's not out of hand. So they're under control with their debt spending. And even in today's environment with low interest rates, I'm even a little more okay with this that they're using uh, cheap cash to invest in the company now um, instead of issuing shares out there. So this is okay. It's they're they're managing it well, I believe. And then we get into our retained earnings section, and you can see that they've been consistently growing their their earnings over over the last ten years. So this is a positive sign. So let's look at the income statement real quick. How's revenue been doing? Revenue, just like Bed Bath Beyond, growth, 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 growth. Every single year they've been growing their top line. They have been increasing sales, which makes sense when we talked earlier about how their sales force is offensive and not defensive. It makes sense. Once they generate a sale, it's pretty much locked in over, over a number of years, 10, 20 years 
could be a perfectly reasonable time period for one sale to be generating uh, revenue for the company. So once you have the sale, you're on to the next one. So we should expect this to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. Um, cost of revenue, how are our margins doing? Uh, we're keeping it pretty pretty consistent, 20%, 21%. 22%. Uh, so it's within this pretty pretty tight band here. So our gross profit is we're still making 78%, 79% percent gross margin on our product. And that makes sense for a software company because once you create the database, it doesn't take a whole lot to replicate it over multiple, uh, multiple customers. So we can see here that their margins are extremely high. What about SGNA? SGNA seems to be pretty consistent, if not dropping from 26 down to 22%. R&D, because this company is so research intensive, this industry is so research intensive and you gotta constantly be on the cutting edge to stay relevant, this is gonna be an important number. How are they spending their money? Are they allocating enough resources to R&D? And given their history, they have been pretty tight on their budget on how much they spend in R&D. It's about 12%, 12.5% every single year that they spend in R&D uh, to continue to get better. Uh, and depreciation, obviously they don't have a lot of fixed assets, so there's not going to be a lot of depreciation out there. Uh, it's a fairly small percentage of their income. So we do have some depreciation, but not, not a whole lot. So how's operating income doing? If we go back 2003, just growing every year. Every year net income is growing. Even in this, in the dark days of 2008, 2009, they were growing their, their company. And again, I think this is a testament to their uh, economic moat and their, their high switching costs for companies. Even if a company has a really bad year, they're not cutting down on their, what's up? Sorry about that. Um, so we can see net income going up and up and up and up and up every single year, uh, which is a good thing. And we can see that that, that, um, that growth has been consistent over the years as well. So you can see net income, that gross operating income percentage has been pretty consistent as well. So they maintain their margins though. Even though there's a pretty competitive business, um, margins have stayed pretty pretty consistent. So that's that's good. Uh, interest expense stayed pretty pretty low. Obviously, their debt is not nearly as high as some other companies, so that's that's been good. Um, let's go down to the cash flow statement here. So how's cash flow doing? So we have net income, again, coming down here. Uh, cash flow from operating activities has been consistently growing year over year over year. Positive sign. So we go down to investing activities. How are they looking here? CapEx relatively small compared to their operating activities. Not a lot of CapEx coming in into the company. Um, however, if we look at this, we look at acquisitions, this is a major part of their of their business and how they're how they're funding their their growth. What this tells me is that Oracle has essentially outsourced their R and D. They, instead of doing a lot of internal research and development, Oracle has been out actively pursuing companies that improve upon their products. So a company goes out and they make a better piece of their database or they make a database that complements theirs very well. They just go out and buy it. They're not, they don't have a lot of research and development internally to make, to make their databases better, but they're going out and they're purchasing it from, from other other companies. So that's been their their main strategy. Not to say they're not doing anything, but it seems that they they are growing their their company through acquisition instead of internal uh, internal research and development. So we can see here that it's it's a pretty significant ratio. It's almost six to one uh, in some cases here that they're they're going out and they're buying up companies instead of investing in internal capex which is okay, but when we go to do our free cash flow measure, I think we need to take this into account. This is an industry where you have to continue to improve and continue to update your software constantly. Um, so I would argue that this acquisition cost that they're spending every year 
is a sort of maintenance capex. It's it's similar to the capital expenditures they have up here, and they're going to have to spend that if they're going to stay relevant every year. Um, so whenever I'm doing my free cash flow analysis, I'm going to take this into account. That they have to spend this money because if they don't, then their product is going to fall by the wayside and it's going to end up um, they'll end up being obsolete. So when we do our calculation, we're going to keep this in mind how how important this acquisition is as well. So how are they doing in their financing activities? Uh, so take a look at their their share repurchases. How are they doing on a net issuance? Looks like they're buying back shares every single year. Every year they're buying back shares. Except for in 2011 they issued a net, a net balance. So all in all, that that seems pretty shareholder friendly. That they're they're going out and they're purchasing shares uh, in the company, buying back shares on a net basis, which is good for for us as a shareholders because that's going to shrink our our base or our the number of outstanding shares. So our piece of the pie grows. Uh, they're also paying out a dividend. Granted, their yield is not not that great. It's 0.06 or or somewhere close to that. It's less than one percent. So they have a very small dividend, but as you can see, it's it's growing a little bit uh, every year. So over time, it seems like that dividend could grow um, as the company grows. How are they doing with debt? So what's their net issuance of debt? Looks like they were borrowing. They were borrowing, and then they start paying back. So their debt load is growing, which could be a little bit of a concern that they they need to go out and have and get external sources of capital to finance their expansion. And this would make sense because they have um, they have a very aggressive acquisition strategy to to grow the company. So you're going to need large sums of money all at once uh, to finance the, the company. You're not you're not just building one or two stores here. They're like Bed Bath and Beyond was. Um, you got to go out and got to make a big splash all at once. You got to spend that five, six billion dollars all at once. So, financing it through through debt could make some sense there. That they would have to go out and, and borrow to do it. And with this low interest rate environment, um, I'm okay with with a little bit of that. It's not not too crazy as we saw on the balance sheet. Um, okay, so we get down to our free cash flow, and as you can see here, it grows every single year. But again, as we talked about with the acquisitions, these two numbers do not include those acquisitions, which I found to be rather important to the company. So I'm going to have to deduct that from this when I do my evaluation of, of the company, which we can get into right now. Let's go to our discount cash flow evaluation and look at where we start. So on the free cash flow side, we looked at... Um, we look here at what the basic inputs are. We start with our 12%. We start with our 3% terminal value. And the growth value is, they're saying 19.1% is the growth rate that we can expect in free cash flow. So over the last five years, they've grown at 18%. And free cash, over the last 10 years, it's been 20.2%. So the average of those two is 19.1%. What do I think of that? I think that's rather high and I think once we get into this law of big numbers here they're a 167 billion dollar company can you really grow a company that big that fast so I think we need to adjust that number down a little bit I would say it probably can come down uh, quite a bit more than that so 19% is not going to be where we're going to start with with our growth rate um, if we go through and look at look at the history of this, if we look at 2008 through 2011, we have 14.6, we have 17.6, 16.3, um, 8.6. Uh, these numbers they look a little a little bit lower here than than the 18 percent. Um, I'm not convinced that they're going to be able to grow at 18%. That it just seems like they're just too big to do that. Plus, you get to a point where 
there's a diminishing uh, opportunity because all the big companies out there have their own enterprise solutions.